Good afternoon and good evening here from Singapore. Um, welcome to the Davos Agenda 2021, which is a series of virtual meetings across the planet to discuss some of our biggest challenges facing all of us across the world. Uh, my name is Warren Fernandez and I'm Editor-in-Chief of the Straits Times here in Singapore. I'm also President of the World Editors Forum, which is based in Frankfurt. And I have uh, colleagues from around the world who are also joining virtually. And our, the focus of our panel, which is on building crisis-resilient healthcare systems in a post-COVID-19 world, is really on the global response to COVID-19 crisis and what learnings we might take away from that to help us prepare for future challenges that might come. And to tackle this subject, the WEF, as always, has put together a very distinguished panel, a group of leaders who are active in this field. Let me just introduce them very briefly. First of all, uh, we have Pascal Soriot, who is Chief Executive Officer of AstraZeneca. Um, then we have uh, Katharina Bohm, who is CEO of the Foundation for Innovative New Diagnostics. Thirdly, Kevin Washington, President and Chief Executive Officer of YMCA USA. And last but certainly not least, Mazen Dawaze, Executive Vice Chairman and President, Middle East and North Africa for Hikma Pharmaceuticals Private Limited. Thank you all for making time to be with us. Uh, I'm sure we're going to have a, an interesting session on this very important topic. It happens almost a year to the day when cases of um, viruses uh, started popping up all around the world. In Singapore here, the first report in my newspaper and others was on January 23rd. And what a lot has happened to all of us in that time, we've had multiple lockdowns to flatten um, the infection curve and to help our healthcare systems cope with the outbreak and prevent them from being overwhelmed. We've had national and state level travel restrictions and the closing of borders, quite counterintuitive in our globalized world. And we've had the rapid efforts to find a vaccine at warp speed which was nothing less than a triumph of human ingenuity and collaboration. Unfortunately, the rollout of those vaccines and the general global response has not been so salutary. It's been less global, more national, less cooperation, more contention and division. The WHO panel on pandemic prepar preparedness said this, um, despite the myriad shiny examples on every continent of of human ingenuity in response to the virus, we have failed in our collective capacity to come together in solidarity to create a protective web of human security. In diplomatic speak, that's quite an indictment. But we're not here to point fingers or fight, fault find or, or assign blame. I think the purpose of our session today is really to see what learnings we can take away from what we've experienced to help us prepare for the next crisis, which will come inevitably, whether it's another pandemic or the dreaded disease X or something related to climate change, for example. And this is what I've asked each of my panel members to start with, to share with us very briefly the two or three big ideas that they think we need to focus on to help us do better for the next crisis. And I'd like to start with Pascal, please. Hello, Ryan. Yes, Pascal, please go ahead. Yeah. Um, do you want me to? Uh, do you have a question you wanted me to ask? Or yes, sorry. I'd like. I'd like. First of all, the, the the broad question is: What are some of the things you think we can draw from the experience with dealing with COVID nineteen to help us prepare for the next challenge that is going to come inevitably? Okay. Well, thanks, Juan, and it's really a pleasure to be. Uh, with you today, join the panelists and contribute to this discussion. So let me first of all say that uh, I think globally it's fair to say uh, we could and should have been better prepared for this pandemic. There are many good examples of uh, tremendous public-private uh, collaboration, actually, in many countries. I think really what has not worked very well, in my opinion, is global collaboration um, and also, you know, better preparedness. So if we think about uh, health care systems in the future and, and how do we uh, invest and shape what we do to be better prepared, the first thing to do is to invest in uh, prevention and early detection and early treatment. Um, if you think about how the money today is deployed, in the OECD countries, for instance, about 3% uh, of uh, total health expenditure is spent on prevention, only 3%. 
you know, we always say it's better to prevent than uh, cure or treat. And everybody would agree, but the reality of the numbers is that only 3% of healthcare expenditures is spent on, on prevention. 20% of this 3%, which is 0.6% of total healthcare expenditures, is spent on immunization and early detection of disease. So essentially, we kind of tend to wait for people to become sick to kind of try to uh, address that, as opposed to early detecting disease and preventing it. Uh, on the other hand, for instance, an example of uh, uh, an, another, another an example of a disease that where we spend a lot of money is chronic kidney disease, and about eighty percent of uh, chronic kidney uh, disease patients are, are not diagnosed. So a lot of people have uh, chronic kidney disease, they are not diagnosed and they get worse and worse and worse over time until they end up uh, quite sick, um, potentially in, uh, di in uh, dialysis, and of course becoming uh, very expensive for healthcare budgets um, on top of the miserable life that they end up living, being on dialysis. So again, investing in, in diagnosing those patients early, treating them early would be uh, a much better investment of healthcare dollars. So whether it's you know viral infections uh, or whether it's just other diseases, uh, a lot more investment in prevention needs to go. We also need to optimize, I think, the place where healthcare is uh, delivered. Uh, there's a lot of reliance on hospitals, and we need to try and shift care to uh, to the to the outpatient uh, services to GPs in particular and a number of countries are doing this but need to increase that and rely more on digital uh, tools to facilitate the treatment of patients at, outside hospitals um, you know digital innovation is really helping a lot in our case in our company we have really leveraged digital tools a lot over the last uh, 12 months 10 to 12 months to help patients continue to be treated outside the hospital because, because they didn't want to go to the hospital and therefore were not treated properly. Pe people who have chronic uh, asthma, people who have other chronic conditions, cancer, uh, the use of uh, digital innovation has been a tremendous tool to help uh, keep these patients being treated without having to necessarily go to the hospital as much as before. And we all know because we've experienced it Doctors are now using a lot more digital tools to interact with their patients, and it's, it's improving productivity, but also improving um, the way care is, uh, is delivered at scale, quite frankly. The last thing I would say is that we also need a, a shift in mindset, and we need to consider health as a strategic asset that you invest in as opposed to a cost that you try to minimize. And a lot of efforts today go into minimizing the cost of healthcare when, in fact, we realize when people are sick, the uh, economy can be pretty much damaged. And of course, COVID is a great example of this. So it's, it's important for governments and, and people around the world to shift the mindset to health is, a, is an asset that you invest in as opposed to a cost to you minimize. And of course, you try to improve equity because typically, especially in case of infections, we're only safe when everybody is safe. And that's why at AstraZeneca, we decided to provide this vaccine to everybody around the world at no profit and as quickly as possible so that we could stop the, the virus from spreading and potentially mutating and returning to the uh, rich countries. Thank, thank you, Pascal. Uh, so early detection and prevention and diagnostics, which is really up the street of Katerina because that's, that's what she focuses on. So let me draw her in at this point on the same question that I had for you. What are some of the two or three big ideas you think we need to take away from our experience? Katerina. Yeah, sure, thank you. And let me just say that I'm speaking here on behalf of FIND, but also on behalf of the ACT Accelerator, you know, the global response to COVID, where we co-lead with the Global Fund, the, um, the diagnostic pillar. So as has been said, the world has been paying a price for the chronic underinvestment in tests and diagnostic infrastructure. Testing, as Pascal has said, is the backbone, backbone for resilient healthcare systems. It's really our eyes and ears. And for every outbreak, it will be our first line of defense um, to hold it. 
Um, industry and the act, act accelerated during this crisis have moved fast in terms of high speed development of and scale up of tests. Um, you know that have allowed implementing now of mass testing in care homes, in schools, in workplaces. Um, but while we have been moving fast, so has the virus, right? As you know, every day we're, ne we're seeing new strains emerge more easily, more transmissible and potentially more deadly. And for 70% of the world, we barely know what's going on. You know, we have very little testing rates in low and middle income countries. We test an average 10 times less than in high income countries. We have very little or no sequencing capacity in most countries. And so we fly blind um, in a lot of places. This situation has to change, uh, not just to exit this crisis, but to prevent future crises. You know, we owe it to all those that die and died from COVID-19 um, to make sure that we build on the investments during this crisis. We will have tripled our manufacturing capacity for diagnostics. We will have advanced digital technologies and, and you know, we'll, we'll be at the forefront in terms, of, in terms of CRISPR and other cutting edge technologies. And so let's make sure to, together that this investment in testing is sustained and can be used for the next crisis and, and to avoid the next crisis. Thanks, Katharina. Uh, just a very quick follow-up for you. I, I just come from a conference that was held here, here in Singapore where every delegate had to go through a very quick test, an antigen test, and the results came back within 20 minutes or so. So that technology has been improving over the last year or so. How far have we progressed and in terms of managing the technology as well as getting the cost down so that we can get it out to more and more people? Absolutely. So we've, we've made a lot of progress, both in terms of the high performance of these tests, they're very accurate now, but especially also when it comes to the cost. We've just announced with uh, several industry partners on Friday an agreement that enables um, testing at $2.50 $2 per test for low and middle income countries. And that is compared to starting price in, in August of over $20. So it's a big shift. Okay, thank you, Catherine. Then let me move to Kevin from, from the US. Kevin, I mean, let's hear your, your opening thoughts, especially because a, a pandemic like this also involves getting the community involved and they have to be part of the solution, certainly. Absolutely. Thank you again for me being here. Appreciate the opportunity to speak on behalf of uh, YUSA and from a non clinician perspective. First of all, I think it's important that there's a stronger connection from clinic to community, because we all know that at least 80% of health outcomes happen outside of the clinical system. Secondarily, particularly in the United States, we absolutely have to move toward universal health care. Um, that is a particular issue that has to happen. And the other thing that's important in the States is, we, we, as you know, we have a system, a systemic racism issue that is prevalent in our country. And that has been built, breaking down that trust to ensure people of low income or of different backgrounds get the opportunity to engage in the healthcare system. Without that, we will never be able to tackle pandemics. Even now, as we're going through the vaccine process, there are several people of color who distrust the system and will not accept the vaccine because of the historical nature of what they had to deal with. So stronger clinical to, to community connections, um, making sure we move toward a universal health care system because in the states, the, your health care in most instances is protected, is uh, directed to your occupation. So in this pandemic and you lose your occupation, they lose, many folks are losing their health care. So universal health care and more importantly, stronger clinic connection issues and continuing to address the racial inequities and the systemic racism that have prevented so many people from seeking health care system, the health care system in our country. Thank you, Kevin. You, you touched on the issue of trust, and I think that's so critical because, you know, if people don't have trust in the system and the science, uh, then it's hard to communicate basic information about the importance of 
hygiene and wearing masks and things like that. But trust is something you need to build up outside of the crisis. You know, it's like a bank account. You've got to build it up so you can draw it down when the crisis hits. And we're interested to hear your thoughts on that, that issue of what we can do to build up the trust ahead of the next crisis. I think the most important thing is working with those agencies and organizations, and I'll say it like the lot, who are in these <laughs> communities that have built up the levels of trust. There's so many in churches, um, uh, nonprofit entities that the clinicians can work through and with to help build that trust. People trust those organizations because they've been around them for quite a while. So the opportunity to work collaboratively with them. I can give you a, a specific example. I know in Philadelphia, where I live, I quite a bit of my time at, the Black Doctors Association having been on the ground doing quite a bit of work. And that is because people know them, they've had the opportunity to connect with them, that's built up quite a bit of trust. So they're being able to expedite the vaccine program because of the level of trust. And they're going to barbershops, they're going to churches, they're going to community ent entities where people have access to get to those ent ent entities. And that has helped build up some of the trust. That shouldn't stop at this pandemic. It should be something that continues all the time. That's how you continue to build up the trust. Thank you. Let me draw in Marzen at this point. Marzen, your, your initial thoughts about what we can do better for the next pandemic, especially to help you know, communities that are less well off and, and more in need of help to deal with these crises. Thank you, Warren. Actually, in the Middle East, what we witnessed was basically the vulnerable communities were the hardest hit, hardest hit, number one. Number two, we saw a lot of slow response from the decision-making institutions in the public sector, the governments. So what we did, and I think a very good lesson learned, was to support the vulnerable communities by giving them access to medicine. Uh, the doctors in many countries where they don't have communication, uh, also, we did uh, what Pascal has said. This has been a very good tool for the telehealth communication with doctors, especially in countries where vulnerable like Sudan, like Algeria, uh, like Syria, Lebanon, Lebanon. All of these countries were very vulnerable, the communities in them in Iraq. So we, were, we reached out uh, by, avoid, by trying to provide the latest of what's going on. We worked with the governments in providing them with the necessary protocols, especially for the outbreak because the Arab countries, the 18 different Arab countries, every country had different response from the other countries. So we worked very closely with the healthcare communities in providing them with what's the latest in terms of technology. One of the other issues is very important is basically the supply linkages to enhance global trade. We witnessed the shortages in many countries, what they started doing by introducing global trade by having national hoarding for APIs and supply of raw materials. And this really hurt a lot the supply chain going forward, especially at the beginning. Then we were able to overcome this by getting in contact with the governments directly or by some backdoor uh, negotiations, I would say, with these governments in order to show them the seriousness of what has been done. At the same time, responding quickly to the supply chain demand of hospitals, because, for example, when there were shortages in the U.S. for the generic pharmaceuticals, we were able to shift our production lines to produce more injectables in order to provide the healthcare uh, providers with medication, especially in the injectable line for treating COVID patients. So all of this, because we are a generic company and we expand our reaches in a very different market segment, than the, than the European and the other markets. So we were able to focus on these things and basically build trust. But going forward, I think there must be more co co cooperation between the different healthcare communities, and, and especially in this part of the world, the Arab world I'm talking about, and supporting the vulnerable communities with, where, where we have witnessed a huge, uh, a huge under, I would say, uh, healthcare uh, infrastructure with these communities. So we went in and we worked a lot with the governments and with the local communities, with the NGOs, in order to build also a trust with them in order to accept what's going on and see how we can get through this pandemic going forward. Mazen, the, the World Health Organization have, has spoken about a catastrophic moral failure in terms of the, the delivery of vaccines to less uh, well-off communities. I mean, 40 million jabs in nearly 50 rich countries, but only 25 in poor countries. 
you think that's something we're going to have to do much better on in terms of you know making sure everybody is safe because nobody is safe until all of us are safe. Yeah, no, I think uh, what Pascal has said, I commend what AstraZeneca and the other multinationals have done in providing with the different programs, uh, vaccinations for the vulnerable communities. Because really what you, what you see, the vulnerability of these communities, they will have a very long list of the supply chain when it comes to them. And we're witnessing that in many countries. And I think uh, the world has to live up to the standards of providing better health care for everyone. So the report about the WHO, I believe, has been actual. But also the WHO, what we noticed at the beginning, they were giving very contradicting statements. So also this is something I think we have to build trust again in these international institutions. I hope now with the things that are going on in the world politics, it will allow people to have more trust in these multinational organizations to provide better healthcare solutions for the communities going forward. Thank you. I'd like to bring the discussion back to the, the issue of collaboration you know, between countries and collaboration between the nations and uh, na national level and the state level, as, as well as collaboration between the public and private sector, because I think it's absolutely critical if, if, we, if we can sort of get people working together. Uh, and maybe I could start by asking Katharina to, to address that question. Better co collaboration at different levels, maybe uh, industry, state, governments. Absolutely. I think a couple of successful examples have already been highlighted. Um, but let me maybe speak a little bit more concretely about the vital role of industry in, in the COVID-19 uh, crisis response now, but then also in helping us build sustainable, resilient health systems. So, you know, industry has a vital role to play for me in, in two regards. Um, and that goes far beyond healthcare industry. A, lead and advocate. So what we need from a testing perspective today is that industry takes a leadership position, builds, you know, um, builds good workplace testing strategies and advocates with governments to help us get the funding necessary to drive an equitable testing response in all countries. That is absolutely key to restart the global economy and avoid a much deeper crisis going forward. You know, with the focus on vaccines, we see that many countries even sort of decrease their testing and, and that we're at a very dangerous point here. And then second, we need industry to continue to commit and invest. Invest in R&D, of course, and also the scale up of testing. Um, to help us, for example, build a strong sequencing network that relies also on digital solutions, on supply chain solutions. But we need a globally connected um, sequencing network. Second, you know, the, the commitment part, um, you know, we, we have been successful in getting the cost down, but we have to get the price down further, especially if we want to enable mass testing now for COVID, but then why testing for differential diagnoses going forward, right? For example, ident identifying any kind of respiratory virus and outbreak early. So for that, we need industry, for example, to join our buyers consortium very concretely, um, you know, to set up best in class testing strategies at their workplaces for their own workforce, but then also contribute to the global effort, um, you know, and by having a pooled buyers consortium to allow us to get the price down and, and to enable uh, greater forecasting abilities, et cetera, in terms of supply chain, manufacturing, and so forth. Thank you. Thanks, Catherine. I'd like to turn back to Pascal, I mean, on the issue of collaboration. I mean, AstraZeneca has been working with uh, the, the WEF as well as LSE on a, an initiative to help bring you know, parties together to help promote collaboration and, and, and mutual sharing of information. Maybe you could tell us a little bit about that initiative so that folks who are watching this might be uh, you know, informed about that. Uh, co uh, collaboration, I think, is absolutely uh, critical. And uh, it is in the, in the DNA of our, of our company 
you cannot be in innovation if you're not prepared to collaborate because it's out of collaboration that innovation emerges. So we do this constantly with academia and various other parties. I think the, the COVID is a good example of, uh, of a situation where we had many, many good examples of public-private partnerships. Um, our partnership with Oxford University being an academic center and also governments around the world is a good one with Barda, Pfizer, uh, Moderna, JNJ, everybody has collaborated with uh, various private and public uh, uh, actors to really deliver the vaccine uh, as quickly as possible. And we should remember that um, what we're trying to do collectively here has never been done in the history of the world, to develop a vaccine or several vaccines in that instance in, in a year, and then scale up to billions of doses when we know today the biggest manufacturer has only got a capacity of a billion doses per year across all their vaccines. So it's a huge undertaking that has only been possible because we've collaborated. In our case, an important collaboration is with Serum Institute of India, which is really enabling us to supply the vaccine to the low middle income countries at a very, very low cost. So in fact, we do it at no profit. So we make sure that everybody around the world is protected. And so, you know, we also believe that um, um, we can apply this collaboration to the future to, co to, to bring, uh, again, public and private actors to, to work on how can we make a uh, healthcare system more resilient, more sustainable in the future. And we have a partnership with uh, the WEF and the London School of Economics that has started that is called the Partnership for Health System Sustainability and Resilience. And the idea really is to work on how, what policies should be put in place so we, we, um, we, you know, we bring a better collaboration. I have to say the first phase of, the, of uh, COVID is full of good examples, but it's also full of places where we see international collaboration hasn't been the best. Um, could have been a first of July Independence Day kind of a moment, but it unfortunately wasn't because there was a little bit of me first um, uh, behavior. But I, I can see that things are changing and international collaboration is, is emerging around areas of uh, identifying early signs of, of new infections, new pandemics, looking at mutations. This virus is going to mutate. We need to track it and we need to look at emerging uh, strains. So there is more and more, I think, collaboration that is actually emerging out of this crisis. Thanks, Pascal. I was watching your collaboration with my, my alma mater and cheering you on all the way. So I was glad to see that collaboration between industry and universities working so well and delivering the vaccine so quickly. Um, we do need to wrap up the public session of this, of this discussion before we move into the closed private discussion on, the, on ways in which we can collaborate more closely. If you want more information on the, on the collaboration between AstraZeneca, WEF and LSE, you can look at it on the website. Uh, I, I need to wrap up this session to, to say basically that some of the big ideas that have been put forward about early detection and prevention, better diagnostics, uh, linking up outpatient care and, and moving it more to the community, building up testing as well as trust in the system and in the science are all things we need to do if we're going to build crisis resistant uh, and crisis res resilience uh, systems for future crises.